Welcome to the Policy and Practice Supporting Ready Patient Access to Test Results. My name is Tom Deneen with Kaufman & Associates and will be assisting with the logistical support for this Zoom session. To ask questions, click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you have general comments, please click the chat button also at the bottom of your screen. This will pull up the chat box, which will open to the right side of your Zoom interface. Additionally, we ask that you select the speaker view option located to the top right side of your Zoom interface. This will, allow to, this will allow you to see the speaker as they present or share information. If you need technical assistance during the session, please type the issue into the chat box and one of our techs will respond to you. Finally, please be aware that today's session is being recorded. Closed captioning is available by clicking the CC icon at the bottom of your screen. I will now turn it over to Elise Sweeney Anthony. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Elise Sweeney Anthony, and I'm the Executive Director of Policy here at ONC. I have the pleasure and the honor of leading our regulatory policy development, policy framework, strategic planning work. Um, and as part of that, it is always my pleasure to think about how we are going to incorporate um, and engage with patients and the patient landscapes in the work and the work that we're doing. And that's what we're here today to talk about. So when we think about our work at ONC, patients are front and center, not only in terms of supporting patient care and making sure that information is where it needs to be, when it needs to be there, but also as it relates to direct patient access by the patient or their representative to their electronic health information. And that electronic health information includes lab results, it includes image results, and, and, and it includes other test results. And in the Cures Act final rule, ONC talks about the sharing of electronic health information to patients, and that not doing so may be considered information blocking. And while there may be certain reasons why information is not shared with the patient or with others, and in the rule we call those exceptions, the norm should be that electronic health information should be available to patients without unnecessary delay. For many patients, that may mean that they have access to their test results in a portal. And as the Journal of American, Medi of American Medical Association study noted, um, and one of our panels will talk about this later today, 96% of patients preferred receiving immediately released test results online, even if their healthcare practitioner had not reviewed the result as yet. And the study also showed that this held true even for individuals who received abnormal results where 95.3% of patients who received abnormal test results would like to continue to receive immediately released results. So there's a lot of conversations that have been supporting this movement, this um, kind of new landscape that we have today where patients have more immediate access to their results. And the Cures Act final rule provides the foundation for that to occur. But we also know that this is something that has been happening in many ways well before the Cures Act final rule because many providers and many provider systems were implementing these types of provisions even before that rule. What the rule provides is a foundation so that all patients have access to the results in that same way without unnecessary delay. Um, so one of the things that we're going to talk about today is really shining the light on some of the innovation that has happened to support this movement, to support patients having this access. And one of the things I just want to highlight as well is that we've also heard from patients directly about how important this access is, whether it is because it gives patients time to read through the results, take in an unexpected result, be better prepared with questions for their next doctor visit, or whether the anxiety of waiting for a provider to call them is alleviated through having access to their own lab results online. Patients have resoundingly supported this requirement. We also know that every patient is different. And that is not only okay, but it is supported in the rule. A patient may decide that viewing results online as soon as they come in is right for them. They may also decide that they wanna receive their test results from a doctor in the doctor's office the rule supports both options for patients. And indeed, this is a new world. This is a, a necessary world. And having those options for patients is critical to care. It's critical to shared decision-making. It is cr critical to an informed patient, a world where patients have truly ready access to their test results. That's where we are today. It's a new paradigm for some, yes. For other providers, they were doing this well before ONC's rule. 
And by this requirement, like I mentioned, we're really establishing the foundation so that all patients, wherever they are seen, can access their test results without unnecessary delay. And you'll probably uh, see me in my excitement on this issue throughout this call because it's something that is also um, extremely dear to my heart. Um, not only because as I often tell my team, we are all patients. We're all patients, whether uh, we have a chronic condition or whether you know, we're caring for our children or a family member or a parent, we're all patients. So this is something that we all see in our daily lives, um, but it's also something that we hear so much about. How do we continue to support patients and support their care and continue to support the provider patient relationship as well and the communication um, that is part of that. So what we do know is that, you know, since the rule providers, developers, labs, and other information blocking actors um, are helping to bring this requirement to life and they're doing so in innovative ways. Um, and that working with providers and hearing what's happening with patients and, and, and how patients are talking about how their life has changed as a result of having more ready access to their test results, is truly exciting to see. And I should also say that I've seen it personally. So as a breast cancer survivor, I chose to receive my, uh, my findings of breast cancer, whether I had breast cancer or not through my portal. And that was a decision that was right for me. And the impact of that, of this provision and what it means for patients like me and others who are not like me, who decide that they, uh, wanna, ha they wanna have the option for this test result, but maybe not for another one, right? the rule recognizes that there are many different types of patients um, and that their needs may be different and their wants may be different. So the, the provider communication that ensues uh, with the patient regarding their options of seeing their results and what, what might be in the results is key to this conversation. And I really look forward to hearing from the panelists about what they have been engaging in in terms of that as well. And I can say for myself, throughout my care journey and multiple surgeries and multiple biopsies, I have continued to receive my results um, this way. Um, and because it works for me. And, and for me, it has helped me to manage my care while also having a job um, and being a mother. It has also helped my husband to be part of my care team and to help me with some of the questions that I wanted to know before I went into uh, my next visit with my doctor. Um, so it has really supported my ability to think through care options, understand my disease, and the tests that were literally saving my life. Um, and the day that I found out I had breast cancer through that portal surely changed my life. I, I definitely cried and I was in disbelief and not really the way I was planning to go into my 40th year. But after waiting for the biopsy for some time, I now knew what I was facing. And I was able to look at the results on my time with my husband by my side um, and through the fair and through the tears, which came and went numerous times that night, I picked up my phone and I called a friend who had breast cancer, who had had breast cancer. And she helped me get ready for my next appointment. And I cannot tell you what that meant for me to be able to hear from someone who had gone through my struggle. And I could say, I just found these results and you know, I'm just trying to figure out how to take this all in. And she helped me do that. She helped me put together a list of questions. And though that list of questions actually made my next appointment with my care team way more effective because some of the tears has subsided, not all, but some had subsided and I had time to think about what I wanted to ask. I had time to ask about different care options, to think about care options so that when I went into that doctor's appointment, I could focus on that a little bit more, not perfectly, but a little bit more. Um, and that was key for me. And it really helped me on my journey. And I think it really also helped um, my care providers because I could focus a little bit more on the challenge that was ahead of me. And like I said, that's just my experience. And that's why when we talk about the information blocking provisions and we talk about the policy, we often talk about it as case by case. And that exists in the same place when we're talking about patient access and the way patient access is supported by the information blocking regulations, case by case. And in this case, in this provision, it's really important that what we have in place supports different types of patients. Patients who would prefer to hear from their provider in the doctor's office. And then patients like me, 
who were supported through having um, this ready access to test results and the communication that my provider told me, hey, these test results are gonna be in your portal. And if you wanna look, you're welcome to look. Here's what you might see. Um, and then also creating that avenue for me to think about my questions in preparation for my next appointment. So we know that the landscape of patients are different. And we know that there are patients who are battling cancer, chronic diseases, rare diseases. And there are also patients who are having routine tests done. And in all of those scenarios, ready access to lab results is critical to care. So as we talk about innovation, we cannot just talk about innovation in terms of the tech supporting this new world. That's important. But we also have to talk about the innovation in terms of how providers are communicating with patients about their test results. And that's critical as well. We have to recognize that health disparities and the digital divide are also part of this conversation. We have to take the time to share the successes and implementation approaches and learn from the not so successful approaches. Indeed, there is much farther to go in the innovation conversation. And the requirements in the Cures Act final rule provide a foundation for the health IT community to have those conversations. It's a wonderful way to share what progress looks like having calls like this. And it is truly my pleasure to moderate this wonderful panel today. Uh, these are the conversations that are needed and I am honored to be here today. Um, with that, I wanna take a minute and welcome you all to this policy and process discussion, supporting ready patient access to test results. And today we have four phenomenal panelists who will share their experiences and their work. Um, and then we will open it up for questions for the panelists. And with that, let me tell you a little bit about our panelists and then I'm gonna turn it over to them uh, to talk a little bit about their work. So first we have uh, Dr. Grace Cordovano. Um, she founded Enlightening Results in 2010 as the culmination of her life's experiential, experiential learning and education, Dr. Cordovano is dedicated to fostering personalized patient advocacy services, specializing in oncology. She strategically guides patients and their care partners through survivorship or end of life care planning with empathy, ensuring individuals are armed with the most pertinent, medically credible, easy to understand information and tools to make empowered decisions about their care. Dr. Cordovano completed her master's degree and PhD in biochemistry at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in Bronx, New York. She is a board certified patient advocate via the international credentialing of the Patient Advocate Certification Board. And we also have Dr. Trent Rosenblum, and he is the vice chair for faculty affairs and a professor of biomedical informatics with secondary appointments in medicine, pediatrics, and the School of Nursing at Vanderbilt University. He directs My Health at Vanderbilt, one of the nation's oldest and most adopted patient portals, which he uses as a rich bed for research and patient engaging technologies. Dr. Rosenblum is also a co-author of the recently released uh, uh, study that I mentioned earlier on patient access to test results through a portal. We also have Sean Bina from Epic, and he's a vice president of access and patient experience at Epic. He divides his time between strategic product planning and helping customers to transform the patient experience. He currently focuses on how organizations can lift patients across the digital divide and rethinking the care experience using, for example, virtual options, ambient voice, and AI. And Devin McGraw. Devin McGraw is the lead for data stewardship and data sharing at Invite. Previously, she co-founded Citizen, a platform for patients to gather their health information prior to its acquisition by Invite. From 2015 to 2017, she directed US Health Privacy and Security as Deputy Director of Health Information Privacy at the HHS Office of Civil Rights and as Acting Chief Privacy Officer at the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT and alum. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and we're gonna start the conversation. And I wanna just emphasize that we are gonna leave time for questions at the end. I also have some of my amazing team who is uh, in, in, in the chat as well. Um, and we'll try to answer any questions that come up as well if, if they are related to ONC pieces, but really just wanna highlight um, and focus on uh, many the panelists today and questions that you might have for them as well. Um, so to start, I wanna first go to Grace. 
um, and your work with patients every day. And hoping that you can tell us a little bit about what you do and in terms of patients having more ready access to their electronically available test results, what are you seeing on the ground? And what does this type of access mean for patients? Thanks so much, Elise. And I wanted to thank you and the entire team at ONC for making this topic a priority for always staying on top of what's important to patient communities and families and caregivers. Uh, it is truly an honor to be here and thanks for that question. So my day to day, -to -day as a patient advocate is working with patients and their loved ones from point of diagnosis through survivorship or end of life care planning. I work to connect patients to their medical records to help them understand and to interact with the information that's presented there so that they can start to build a trusting relationship with me and their care team as they face what could be some of the darkest times in their lives. And it's really re been rewarding to see the changes and what patients are seeing when they go to their portal or when new results start coming in. I think I would have to say, people are pleasantly, su pl pleasantly surprised with the convenience and, oh, wow, the results are in and it's so great to be able to access them when I have time, on my time. They feel that it's less of a burden. They don't want to have to ask the nurse or the doctor to go and make a copy and then uh, stop their workflow or stop seeing patients. So even though their doctors and nurses may have been running to go get them a copy of their lab work or a, a copy of their imaging, now they feel like they don't have to burden them because they know that our, our care teams and our clinicians are so overworked and overwhelmed with so many responsibilities. I have to say that there's a comparison in conversations to other industries, which we do see internally. We're always comparing healthcare to other industries. I'm seeing the same thing happen on the patient side where we were just having conversations this weekend about, wow, finally, healthcare looks like it's actually going to move to a digital space. Uh, you know, they're comparing it to their experience in healthcare that their pets may have, where they were frustrated that their pet was getting better care and they were getting more access to information when their pet was hospitalized or going to the veterinarian and they couldn't get their results for very important pieces of their health care. Um, we're seeing comparisons to the car industry. You know, when my check engine light goes on, the mechanic would call me and give me an update. And in some cases, my doctor didn't call me at all, or I'd have to wait weeks for an update. So that there's definitely an acknowledgement of progress and to something more modern and more convenient that meets patients where they are. Um, again, reducing administrative burden that they don't have to go hunting for the records, that they can log in, they can use an app to be able to readily access it. And I loved your personal account and experience of, of sharing that you received the results and it helped you to operationalize. So we're seeing that from patients, from the families that I work with, that it gives them time because let's face it, everyone's life is so busy. And I see this also with women, many women who are also caregivers, maybe for aging parents, may have a health condition of their own. Uh, they may be managing their children's and other loved ones' health. So having that access to information when they're ready to receive it and ready to interpret it and ready to work through it really provides another opportunity to strategize and operationalize. And it gives people this opportunity, just like you said, to ask questions, to process the emotions. And it's an imperfect perfect because the emotions are going to be there when there's something catastrophic that strikes. But again, I love that you pointed out the importance of phoning a, a friend or uh, turning to peer health support, turning to colleagues, turning to neighbors, parishioners, members of your community on what their experiences are. Because really, when you get a result, most people want to know, gosh, what do I need to do now? What do I need to do now? Next. So there's this opportunity to prime and prepare uh, for that next healthcare encounter. The opportunity to connect to peer health support has been powerful because people may not be able to understand all of the words that are in their report, but they're connecting if they're fortunate enough to know about nonprofits or know about advocates that work in different disease spaces to start asking questions. I'm seeing conversations on Twitter and in Facebook groups about, hey, I got this result. What do you guys think? What, would I, what should I do? And there's suggestions on questions on what may be missing, what's important, or maybe, hey, you should start preparing preparing that there's going to be a biopsy in your future, which allows people now to start preparing their life schedule 
um, I had a patient tell me, well, you know, if my if doctor called me and told me, hey, you need to come in for a biopsy, um, I, that might be something they would schedule in the next day or two. This gives me some more time. I need someone to cover my shift. I need uh, to make sure that I have childcare, or maybe I already have other loved ones appointments or other healthcare appointments. So it helps me juggle what's already a very full life with a lot of different commitments and obligations. I love hearing that patients are telling me there's new conversations happening at point of care, that their doctor is participating in pre-counseling or warning them and saying, hey, you know, we're going to run this result. This is what it may or may not show. Just want you to be prepared. And they're almost taken aback saying, hey, I'm feeling like a partner here. So this movement towards shared decision making where the doctor and patient are on the same team has, because the results are now more available, many patients are commenting and saying, hey, this actually feels really good. And it opens up a space where maybe culturally a patient might not ask their doctor questions or may not want to say more than yes or okay and nod or be pretty quiet. So it's definitely operating, uh, opening channels for operating in a new way from a patient and caregiver perspective. I think we're also seeing some issues, which I'll point out. Um, one of it is where people read the reports and they're like, gosh, how could they release a report like this? Like, I, this is useless to me. The format is there's too many words, it's too hard, there's no illustrations. What body part are they talking about in the radiology? Give me the crux of what I really need to know. So I think from the way that we present radiology results and pathology results, and even blood work, patients say, oh, you know what? That's great that I have access to my blood work, but what did it look like as a trend over time? Doc, I've been getting my blood work here for years. I don't want the standalone. Tell me what it's been looking like all, all along. And is it too high or is the level too low? So I think we have some great opportunities to reimagine the way that we present the results now to patients and to, to consumers who will be better able to interact with their health data. People are finding errors, lots of errors, some very minor, but some pretty important. And now they're frustrated that, gosh, how do I go and report this? Or how do I get this changed? And there's some seeing some barriers there. So there's definitely some opportunities, again, to make sure that when a patient voices and finds an error, that that is not discarded and, and ignored. There's definitely a desire for images and actual pathology slide images. So it's uncovering that gap where I know that there's work in progress, but people are hungry for more. That's great, you gave me the radiology report, but my physician needs to see the images. So they have to go get images on CD. So it's one step forward and one step back to a CD and we all know how that works. And there's a frustration that people want to see, okay, here's the pathology report, but where are the images? Show me what the staining looks like. People are very curious and want that. So I think there's an opportunity for more growth there. Lots of questions, I think, about where AI and clinical decision support fall into the results. I have patient communities saying, hey, I know like, I was just at ASCO and the entire exhibit hall floor is filled with AI this, AI this, AI this cool, where is the AI stuff in my medical record? Well, where are those tests and where are those results and outputs that are driving my care? How do I get a copy of that? So a lot of opportunity and intrigue there because patients are saying, well, if someone is using that information, um, I want to be a part of that conversation. And if they're not using it, maybe I should go to a provider who is using this type of AI driven clinical decision support. So I'm, I'm intrigued by that. And I, I would be amiss to say that we need to do more to wrap patients in support and information tools and technology when that result is scary, when that result is catastrophic, when it is going to cause us anxiety and upset. I don't, I do agree with you, Elise, that ultimately it's up to the patients to make the decision as to when they are ready to receive that and if they want their doctor to guide them through that care. But telling someone to not click on it isn't always the best use of our resources. What if that result is a cancer diagnosis? What can we do from a digital health standpoint? Is there a chat bot? Are there educational webinars? Can we better connect patients to peer health support, to an advocate, to a nurse na navigator, the, a social worker? The list goes on and on. I'd love to see more to help patients who do get an unfortunate result or a scary result really wrap them in more resources as opposed to, hey, just don't click on it, just hold on. Thank you so much, Grace. It's so amazing to kind of hear what you work on every day and support the patients and to hear the perspective 
you shared. And I think indeed uh, we are seeing, and I think as we go through the discussion, we'll probably hear more of some of those innovative ways that um, not only is access being supported uh, more readily, but how that, that access is presented in a way that hopefully works for patients. But this is also, I think, an ongoing conversation. And I think that's what's so exciting about what you talked about, the, the opportunities that the rule presents is, or has presented for your um, those you work with, the patients you work with, but also how can we how can we take it to the next level? What are different ways that we can support patients in this new landscape? Um, and I think that's why these conversations are so important, not only for myself and my team and ONC overall to hear what's happening on the ground, but also in terms of the lessons learned and the advancements that some are seeing, sharing that amongst a broader audience. So we're excited to do that um, um, on this call. And I think to that point, I'm gonna turn it over to Trent and Trent, um, I thought you could maybe start by sharing a little bit about um, kind of the role you serve as Director of Patient Engagement at Vanderbilt, as well as the other roles you serve there, and your um, work as an author on the recent study, um, and maybe kind of talk a little bit about those pieces. Hey, good afternoon. So I, I also want to extend a hearty thank you both to ONC for allowing us to think about this really important topic and to all of you who are here joining us this afternoon uh, to help us think about it. Um, to my mind, the uh, change to healthcare that came about as a result of the information blocking rule in the 21st Century Cures Act has been a uh, transformative change to how we deliver care. It's a, a very direct and positive acknowledgement that our patients and their families uh, are part of the clinical care team, are uh, people who really help us manage uh, the patients in front of us. The patient is more than just the person who takes the pill or shows up for the colonoscopy. The patient is a full-on partner. And the work done um, through uh, accommodating the information blocking rule really acknowledges that. Uh, we at Vanderbilt have had a patient portal in place since about 2004. It's not the oldest continuously active patient portal that we're aware of in the world. There are two other health systems that beat us, um, but it's among the top three. And we have about a million users. It is intrinsic to how we deliver care at Vanderbilt. It also exposes a lot of what we call tech witty gaps, uh, equity in tech gaps in who we deliver care to. So that's an ongoing area of both operational work and research that we do. Um, but accommodating the information blocking rule over the past few years has really helped us further engage our patients. Uh, as an aside, so too have things like COVID and the explosion of telehealth. Uh, those are disasters that we're not going to, you know, uh, let pass. And we've certainly embraced those as ways to bring more people on um, since more and more people really had to receive health care remotely. Um, so we now have over, well, about a million users of our patient portal at Vanderbilt. A few years ago, we went uh, and um, migrated to the MyChart platform, uh, which has also been great because it allows us to swim in a much larger pool of people who help us think about implementation and best practices. Uh, that is not intended as a sales pitch, but we do have Epic on the call, and I'm sure they're smiling. Um, so when we went live with accommodating the information blocking rule of the Cures Act, uh, we we not only wanted to really um, serve our patients, but being an academic medical center, we wanted to study the impact of the changes. So we've done a number of studies. Uh, one of our uh, study team members and lead authors is on the call right now. Um, uh, but, you know, I'm at debt to the entire study team who I'm not going to take the time to list, but I just gave you the pay, the, the ultimate paper uh, in the chat you can look at and read. Uh, what we found was in a very early study, um, right after we started accommodating the information blocking rule, patients were starting to see their results four times more 
um, than before the information blocking rule. They were seeing their results before their healthcare professionals who ordered those tests four times more uh, than before. And this led to a doubling of messages sent to the healthcare team within six hours of seeing the results. So this we thought was a really important signal that something has changed. And we, we started a line of research that this paper I put in the chat um, puts a, a, a closing point on. So we found a number of things and uh, Elise referenced a couple of those. I'm gonna go through them briefly now, um, but I encourage you to take the time to look at the full paper. I've also put my Twitter in there if you wanna discuss this after you've read the paper. I'm delighted to do it that way, or you can email me. So what we did was a study at four sites, UC Davis, Colorado, and Schultz, uh, University of Texas Southwestern, and at Vanderbilt, really to represent four major uh, regions within the US. We surveyed 43,000 patients and got a near 19% response rate, which we thought was reasonable. And we asked them a series of questions via a survey that we'd previously validated in a long line of other studies coming out of work that the Open Notes organization had done, and then a few more focused studies on patients' perceptions of receiving their results immediately in a patient portal. Uh, and what we found among those uh, 8,000 respondents is, as Elise mentioned, 95.7, that's more than 19 out of every 20 patients, want to continue to have the kind of access they have now. And that didn't vary whether the result they received in the portal was normal or not. That result didn't vary whether the patient looking at the result became more worried there breast cancer biopsy result came back abnormal. They still wanna have this kind of access to their results, even if they may worry a little bit more. But worry didn't change a whole lot. It uh, went up about seven and a half percent among all of our respondents, and it was a little bit higher among those who received a not normal result. Grace mentioned the concept of pre-counseling Pre-counseling is any number of different things your healthcare professional can say to you, this is why I'm ordering the test. So if you see the result, this is what it means. It might be the notice that the patient receives in the email that says your result is ready. You can look, you don't have to look, your healthcare professional will also see it. It could be the note that shows up in the patient portal if that's how the patient chooses to receive their result before the healthcare professional that says, you have access to this result. You can look, you can choose not to look. It might be something on an after visit summary or in the clinical note that the healthcare professional who ordered the test right says, I am ordering this test. Here are the reasons why this is what I'm looking for. So all of those things constitute pre-counseling. Pre-counseling, we think is a great practice. It's something we still need to study in greater depth to understand what uh, makes it better. But what we learned in this study is that pre-counseling seemed to make it easier for patients if the patient saw the result before the healthcare professional. Um, so those are the main findings. There's a whole lot more richness there. And even better, this, uh, this study has created a really interesting series of conversations in person at conferences and on social media. Um, and we've learned a number of things from the people who have participated in these conversations. First, uh, and this is a full-on, we admit, sort of mea culpa, is that our participants were mostly middle-aged white women who speak English, which means there are a whole lot of people out there whose preferences we still don't understand. That's future work. If you're interested in helping us with that future work, we want to talk to you. Um, we also have heard over and over that, well, that's well and good, but cancer's different. So I'm okay getting my abnormal cholesterol result in the portal before I talk to my doctor, but cancer is different. Our 
data doesn't support that assertion, but it's early data. And so that's another area that we want to study more. We also hear a lot of anecdotes from patients and I, rep um, I referenced one in the Q&A that some patients just prefer to get it electronically at home with their loved ones around. They can clear their mind and then talk to their doctor on Tuesday once their mind is cleared so that they can have a productive conversation about next steps. So that's the time I've got. Lots here that we can talk about, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, so we're gonna keep it going. Um, and I, next, I wanted to go to Sean. So as an EHR developer, um, the systems that providers are often using to see test results and to make sure patients have access to the results, can you share what innovations are underway to support patients and to support patients having more immediate access to their electronic health information, such as test results? Um, so let me turn it to, to Sean to tell us a little bit about his work. Thanks, Elise. And thanks to everyone who's joined and participated in this event. Um, just a little bit of back background and context. Epic has been releasing results directly to patients for almost 20 years. So the idea of releasing uh, test results to patients, patients isn't something new, something that groups have been doing for many years. And in fact, we had many of the first groups that really um, started to do open notes and open results projects on the system well before the 21st century tiers. And so groups have been experimenting with this for a long time in terms of automatically sending results directly to patients before somebody has a full chance to review it. Uh, same thing with notes, being able to release notes as soon as the physician completes the encounter uh, to patients. Um, what 21st Century Cures really did was it brought the, everyone up to par. So now we see very, very rapid release across all of our customers. I was running the numbers and it looks like about 93% of all results coming out of Epic go out within the first day. So within or within 24 hours. 97% uh, go out within 14 days. So I think this is an incredible success that virtually, um, you know, patients are, are getting access to their results at a level that's never historically been available in the past. Uh, we also know that about 77% of those results are reviewed um, by patients in the portal or within my chart. And so patients really do go in and engage actively in getting those uh, results from there. Um, and we also see about 90% of all notes being released to patients. So I think about how, you know, if we, we look back 10 years ago, the availability and access to your clinical information, um, how limited that was in many ways. Um, and now being able to get your test results, your notes, um, all of that um, almost instantaneously is really huge. I always like to tell the story of the first time I had this happen was I had my daughter in to see the doctor um, and she got a strep test. And before the doctor came back, we knew that she didn't have strep. So um, we were able to then immediately have this conversation with the doctor when they came back in the room about the strep test and, and what we should do uh, uh, as an alternative. Um, uh, Trent also uh, mentioned, and I think it's a good point that during COVID, all of this didn't stop, but it actually kind of um, exploded in terms of the use and adoption of the technology. We had lots of groups that were needing to very, very quickly roll out immunizations to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of patients. Um, so they were standing up sites, but the key thing was they needed to be able to get the result back to patients. And um, many of those sites used uh, my chart in order to do that, where they would send just a text or an email to a patient, allow them to very simply sign up and start getting their uh, results uh, online. And that has really been uh, increased access overall. Now, on the innovation side, we continue to work on refining this experience. I'm going to share my screen for just a minute and show you what the current experience looks like. And then I'll send Ben just a minute talking about what comes next. So I'm showing you a clinician view. So I'm in as a doctor taking a look at a patient's record here. Um, so I'm seeing Patricia Adams. Uh, she's been in for heartburn. And I was just in the middle of ordering a CBC for this patient. When I order this CBC, one of the options that I always have here is to indicate whether I want this to be immediately released, which is the default behavior, 
or whether I want to manually release this. So this gives us a way to kind of override uh, the standard behavior of the system, which is that we're going to automatically release the results to the patient and then allow them, uh, allow a particular patient to request, for example, that they don't want to get this result right away. Now, CBC may not be the best example of when you would uh, do this sort of override, but certainly if I was uh, going in for a diagnostic mammogram, um, or something that might uh, have pathology, I might choose um, as a patient that I'd like to uh, get that result later. And this is part of that pre-counseling process uh, that Dr. Rosenblum talked about, where you can um, uh, talk to the patient about what their preference is right up front and uh, then choose whether you're going to share that or not. The same thing is also true with notes. So our default behavior um, is that we're going to release notes right away to patients. Um, but we do have the ability to override that in this particular case. And so I can indicate for one of the exception reasons, and I think there's eight exception reasons um, that kind of break down into different categories, which we sum up in those three, that uh, might be a reason why I would not release a result to a patient. So then from here, you know, by the time I'm finishing this visit with the patient, so I'm signing off on my note and signing off the on the visit, this information is then immediately available to the patient. And let's actually take a look at a couple different uh, patients to see this. So one, we will look at Pat. And I'm going to show you this both from uh, a full website uh, view, but then also from a mobile perspective. So we can see a bunch of things have happened as a result of Pat's visit. She's received an after-visit summary. Um, she has a new consult that she can schedule online. And then notice that her summary is both uh, a view of the instructions that she's received as a part of this visit. So there's all the instructions, as well as that note. And now she has all the detail about the, the clinical thinking that really went into ordering the GI consult uh, for this patient. Similarly, if we look at another patient, we're going to take a look at George here. George has a couple of new results that have come back. So you see uh, that he has this uh, HbA1c, the hemoglobin here, and he can take a look at this result right from here. Um, this is really key uh, to this is that we've added this indication for the patient about whether the clinician has reviewed the results or not at this point in time. So as a patient, I know whether my doctor has had a chance to look at this result as I go to look at it. And then also as a patient, one of the things that's really important is that I can put this all in context. So I can see how my results have been over time. I'm actually uh, trending in the right direction here. Another uh, key thing as a patient when I'm looking at a test result is that one of the things that we do is we make it show that so, sh so sorry, so that test results are interoperable across sites. And so even if I get a result at another organization like the River Hills Health System, when I log into my healthcare organization, I can still see that result from that other site. And then of course, I can get access to all my test results from here. And I can even do things like uh, search my test results or, or find results. Somebody specifically mentioned a couple of concepts. One is being able to get uh, uh, my genome sequencing uh, results uh, from here. So not only can a simple result like a CBC be here, but a more narrative-based results can be here. If I wanted to search for a recent chest X-ray, so I can say search. And then I can see these recent chest x-rays or any of the results that have had a chest x-ray in them. And let me take a look at this particular one. This is actually from a recent um, ED admission where you can see I have lots of different results that have all come together as a part of that encounter. And way down here at the bottom, I think I do have this chest x-ray result. Um, and I can see the narrative and impression directly from here. And um, if the organization provides this, um, and a uh, good example is University of Colorado provided this capability where they offer the ability for patients to actually access the, the full fidelity results through their PACs. Um, and so here you can see uh, that I can actually get access to that chest x-ray result um, directly within uh, the workflow here as a patient. So providing patients with, um, you know, in the past, this is something that you would have certainly had to um, request online, go to medical records, um, all of that in order to get that, have a CD or a DVD burned. But here, uh, that information can be all provided online. 
The last thing that I'll note, um, I'm, I know I'm almost out of time, and that is that um, I think uh, um, a couple of uh, the pr participants have mentioned this. We are working on ways to give patients more overrides. So allowing specific patients to say what types of results they want to get automatically right away versus what types of results they want to wait on. Um, it's trivial because there's obviously a lot of education that goes into you know, different types of results. What is the difference between lab, pathology, imaging results? Um, and so making sure that we provide a tool that is both understandable and scalable for our sites is something we're very actively working on. So that's a flavor for what it looks like today. Hopefully that was helpful for everyone online. Thank you so much, Sean. That was awesome. Thank you for sharing. All right, so that takes us to Devin. So Devin, um, I thought maybe we could start with your experience supporting patients who have cancer and also rare disease. I know that to me that shines a light on how critical data is for supporting care. I mean, we know that data is important for, is important for all types of care. Um, in certain settings like cancer and rare disease, there can often be a, a many, many tests that you have to have along the way. And even for myself, who's in survivorship, thankfully, um, I also have to go in and, you know, I'm getting tests to make sure everything is still okay. Um, so the number of tests that you see um, often when you have a chronic um, disease or cancer or a rare disease um, is often more than you might see in a regular, um, in, in, in a uh, kind of a regular once a year appointment, uh, just a general appointment. So um, with that in mind, I know that what you see and the types of tests and the number of tests that you see as you're um, supporting patients is probably more, <laughs> more than so more than in uh, many other environments. So I thought you could share a little bit about your work um, and also your work as a lab and what you're doing in that respect as well, in terms of supporting lab data being readily available to patients as well. So yeah. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Elise. I don't know if you noticed, but you've got a little survivorship heart that kind of floated up. Oh, I did. That. So, yes. I, I did not, but thank <laughs> it you. Float. It was really cute, like a balloon. <laughs> um, yeah, we really, you know, what's interesting at Invite is we kind of see this issue through both the lens of the importance of making data available to patients as quickly as possible and results being quite key in terms of the, the data that patients need. And then also being on the side of, you know, we do clinical genetic testing. And so it's incumbent on us to have a way to make sure that patients can get access to their data. But I'll start with the importance on the patient side. You know, I came to Invite because they acquired a, a company that I helped to co-found called Citizen, um, which creates a platform that gathers all of a patient's medical records from all the places where they've been seen. And we, we really did start in a couple of subtypes of cancer. And the, the challenge at the time, and this was four or five years ago, was that most of the relevant information that a cancer patient needs to get a second opinion or to do a molecular board consult uh, is often in the unstructured notes. You know, when you talk about lab test results, like th those, those tend to be structured data. That was sort of on early lists of information that was made more available to patients in a portal. But a lot of times the context of those lab results and, and other sort of critical information can come from the notes, which was, which were a little bit more uh, difficult to access. Same thing with, um, pathology test results, which is a test result, but not necessarily coming out of a out of a clinical lab. And so those can sometimes still be a challenge because they don't necessarily get generated out of the same clinical system. Similarly, around genetic test results, they're done by different types of labs than those that, that generate results of, um, of, the, of sort of other types of clinical laboratory assays. And so as a result, you know, it, it, as a patient, you weren't you you historically didn't get kind of a full view or access to kind of all of the information that might be relevant to you uh, in a portal. And then, of course, these patients have kind of multiple providers across the spectrum. You might, you know, uh, end up seeing you know a single oncologist for a cancer patient for some period of time. But if you're you are uh, not successful with your first line of treatment, you might get referred. Um, uh, to another oncologist or you're in survivorship but have um, uh, a flare-up of your cancer later on. Again, they, they, there's usually multiple providers involved, and that's definitely the case in rare. And we, in particular, are working with patients with rare neurological diseases for whom 
the, there are obviously a multiplicity of test results, often from multiple doctors and, and also um, underlying data for test results that's not, again, typically of the type of data that's available in a portal. Like for example, a lot of our rare neurological patients, most of whom are pediatric, have, get EEGs done regularly um, because uh, seizures is a, is a common, um, not exactly a symptom, but a common characteristic of, of their illness. And it's the underlying data that can be quite telling in terms of maybe not as much for the ongoing clinical care of that patient, but a lot of these patients have a very strong interest in making sure their data is can also be made available to researchers so that discovery of better treatments, better, better uh, diagnostic capabilities can continue uh, to move forward at, at as rapid a pace as possible, um, all while also having information that, that, that can be used by the patient for clinical care. So I think I, I, I can't underscore enough that these developments that have been occurring in terms of the data being readily available in patient portals, um, just how important that is for, for patients and their families across all, all sorts of um, uh, serious illnesses, as well as for well patients, but definitely in terms of the experience of the patient groups that we work very closely with and trying to empower them, not just to get the best possible clinical care, but also for them at their choice, if they want to, to be able to share these results for, uh, for <clears throat> research purposes. On the laboratory side, you know, patients are, um, you know, when you talk about lab results in particular, you've really got two places you could potentially go to in order to get your results. One is to get it from the provider who ordered the test because ultimately those results will be communicated to that provider and then available to you, uh, made available to you by them. But increasingly patients will go directly to the laboratory that tested them in order to get those results. And though those patients have long had a right under the HIPAA right of access to be able to get results directly from a lab. But for those of you who know the HIPAA rules, they're, the time frames are a little bit slower. You can take, at least as of today, can take up to 30 days to get a patient their result. Um, labs were not sort of part of the electronic medical record incentive programs. And so a lot of labs do not utilize certified electronic medical record technology that has the, the portal capabilities like, like uh, Sean demonstrated to us from Epic, don't have, don't, haven't necessarily bought um, information systems that have those portal capabilities installed in them. Invitae does. We do have a portal. We don't have a certified portal, but we do make a portal available to patients um, for them to be able to access their genetic test results as soon as they are available, uh, as long as that's the way the patient wants them. And because we, um, we didn't, we haven't had to wait for the, for the, for the technological capability of, you know, allowing patients to make a choice. Do I want my results now? Or do I want to wait until they're communicated to me by my ordering provider and or genetic counselor? Um, we have already given patients the choice. They, they go into their portal and can request their results. And of course, we do have a pathway for our ordering clinicians to be able to provide information, um, to be able to say this is this meets this significant, you know, risk of harm. I think this particular patient would be harmed, significantly harmed by seeing this result, and we're going to hold it back. That capability is, is available again with genetic test results. Um, oftentimes what is community, what, what they mean, if you have a positive result for something is, is, is a potential risk of, of, of having a condition, but not necessarily a foregone conclusion that you will get it depending of course, on the genetic marker that we're talking about. Um, and some are indicators of very serious conditions that, that are a near or absolute certainty. And some are just an enhanced risk. So the communication with a with a learned medical provider, genetic and genetic counselor is pretty important. At the same time, you know, we take the position that patients should get these results when they want them, and if they request them, you know, absent um, their clinician saying there's a significant risk of harm situation. Excuse me, in this situation, we do provide them. Um, it's not always it doesn't always make our clinical customers very happy. 
Um, there, I think for a number of them, I'm, I'm, I'm always pleased to follow. I follow Trent religiously, by the way, Dr. Rosenblum on Twitter, because I find his communications about this are just so spot on. Um, but I, you know, the, this, this is been a very prickly issue in the clinician community. And I think that sometimes for the laboratories that are also trying to make these results available to patients, we can sometimes be on the receiving end of, of, of the concerns that medical providers have about patients seeing results and not fully understanding what they mean. Um, but we are very committed to allowing patients to make the choice about when to receive their results um, and to and and even if that means potentially they're getting results uh, ahead of when they are counseled, we do we don't have direct relationships with patients, so we don't have the opportunity that other clinicians do to have that kind of one on one pre counseling with a patient. But um, but our portal, our patient facing portal, tell it strongly advises patients to speak to their doctor and a genetic counselor about the results. We make genetic counseling services available to to our patients for that purpose. And so, you know, striking that, striking that, that exact right approach, which is let the patient choose, let the patient know it's important for them to seek help in interpreting those results. But ultimately in most cases, it should be the patient's choice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Devin. And we are going to kind of open it up for questions. And while we get ready to do that, and uh, we're pulling questions from the Q and A, um, I thought I would just take a minute to, and I always have to give a public service announcement because I do lead our regula regulations team. And we love to talk about the regulations we do because there's opportunities there for providers, for patients um, to really understand what we are trying to achieve or what we're trying to support in terms of care. Um, you may have heard me say those on the line that, you know, our goal is not health IT. Our goal is not, that's not our end goal. Our end goal is improved care, supporting the care continuum, and health IT is a critical way to accomplish that. Um, so in our rules, I know that there's a lot in um, our rules often, and we also do a whole, whole component around standards and certification of um, systems. But, but there's also the information blocking provisions as well. And that's a lot of the underpinning of what we're talking about today. So why am I mentioning this? Well, we have a rule out right now. It's called HTI-1. So if you just search uh, H, the letters HTI-1 and ONC, it will pull up probably our page, healthit.gov. And you will find, not only will you find kind of a couple blogs on the rule, um, but you will also find some fact sheets you will find some webinars we've done actually on June 1st. If you look up June 1st, you'll see we just did a webinar focused on patients and, and things that we think patients might be interested in the rule. Why this is important? Well, the comment period is coming up for the rule. The comment, well, the comment period is open. The end of the comment period is coming up. So I wanna encourage folks to take a look um, and hopefully comment. Tell us what you're thinking about the rule and what we have in there. And um, that doesn't mean if you want to do 10 pages, 100 pages, 1,000 pages, or one paragraph, doesn't matter. Whatever you want to put in regarding the rule as a comment is helpful to us. We read every single comment, and it really helps us to figure out if are we going down the right path in terms of what we're proposing? Are there other things we need to consider? What's happening on the ground in terms of the experiences that will really help us to get a, get a policy finalized that's gonna make sense and gonna work on the ground? So I wanna encourage folks to do that. Couldn't have a webinar without saying that's coming up. We also have another webinar coming up this afternoon, not this afternoon, I'm sorry, later this week. <laughs> as, as, if, as if one webinar day is not enough. Um, but later this week, we'll have a, another webinar on HTI One. If my team can drop that in the chat as well, that would be great. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is we talked, we're talking today about patient access. We're talking about how the Cures Act final rule supports that in particular and how it supports um, 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 uh, uh, lab results being available without what we call without unnecessary delay. We have a series of frequently asked questions on our website regarding the rules. So if there's questions that folks have as a patient uh, working with a provider, as a provider working with patients, or working with anywhere along the, hair, the care continuum, you can check that out. That's a great resource as well, because there's a lot 
that kind of we um, we touched on today, but that can that goes deeper. For example, healthcare providers are covered under uh, as an information um, blocking actor, which means that they should not be information blocking is our goal, and that if they are, they can be subject to appropriate disincentives. In addition, health information networks, health information exchanges, and developers of certified health IT can also be information um, blocking actors, and they can be subject to up to $1 million per violation um, uh, penalties. So um, that's important because when you think about what a healthcare provider is, um, the definition of healthcare provider does include labs. It includes um, providers that you may think of in terms of the ambulatory setting, but it also includes others, pharmacists, et cetera. So it's good to have an idea of what the definition of healthcare provider is, and that supports you as a patient potentially getting information where you need to get it from. And we also have, and this is my last PSA for today, we also have a portal where you can submit an information blocking claim. So if you think you've been subject to information blocking, you can submit a claim there. And this is a good point for me to mention the importance of the rules, because we also often talk about it in terms of the rules being important to patients. And obviously that is absolutely critical. The other part of it is we also think about the larger health IT continuum. So providers who are trying to get information from another provider to support care also need to have access to the information. So the opportunities that information blocking presents are not just for patients, but also for providers and other in the care, care continuum who are supporting care. Um, so that's something to think about as well. And I know I rattled off a whole lot, but we're gonna put it in the chat. So if it's helpful, you can grab um, the, the, um, grab the links from there. So let me start with the question. The first question we got was for me, uh, uh, apparently. So the question was, um, can, did I take someone to my appointment? Um, and then there was also a question about um, if I took notes during the appointment. So um, the answer to, that, to both are yes. Um, so actually my husband came with me um, to my first appointment. Um, and like I said, you know, it's not um, these are not easy conversations. It's not an easy environment to be in to just find out that um, you know, you have cancer and what are the next steps and then trying to figure out, you know, all the questions that we would all have. How bad is it? How, you know, how far spread is it? All of these questions. Um, but because I had uh, kind of looked in the portal before and I knew um, the, the breast cancer and the type of breast cancer I, I appeared to have, that allowed me to put together a whole suite of questions um, that I did take in. Um, and actually to this day on my phone, I have numerous notes for each uh, provider that I have and it allows me to go back. So it actually helps me and my communications to go back and say, okay, this is what was said or this is what I had or this is what I needed to know. And it allows me to step into my next appointment kind of refreshing my mind because believe it or not, I cannot keep everything in my head. So my notes are really critical kind of to me and how I'm able to help manage my care. Also it helps, you know, my husband as well, because sometimes, you know, he'll have questions for me as well. So in addition to my own questions, I can put his questions in there and that helps us overall to kind of manage my care. Um, and as, you know, I always say that, you know, receiving care and having um, a caregiving team, having a caregiver is something that we can't take for granted. Um, it is not easy going through care. And I've heard this from so many folks we work with um, and we hear from and having a caregiver kind of network, whether it's a child who's helping to care for you or you know, a spouse or a loved one, whoever it is, a best friend, you know, all of that's really helpful to kind of the care journey. Um, and, and particularly if you have a patient representative, I wanna note that that's covered in the rule as well in terms of thinking about patient access. All right, so I think I hopefully covered some of the questions that come up along the way, um, which leaves us space to kind of um, dig in a little bit deeper um, with some of the other questions regarding not so much around the, the rule per se, but the experiences that we've heard. So one question that came in for all panelists is uh, what are your thoughts on potential differences in patient perspective on immediate results, immediate result release for inpatient care setting versus ambulatory care setting. So I'll 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 open I'll open the floor. I'll take a stab at that. I've seen some positive conversations and feedback in that many times the families feel like they're not getting enough information when their loved one is admitted. And a lot of times physicians may round very, very early, or maybe the loved one has stepped out to go get coffee or make a phone call or use the restroom and they miss the doctor. So having the results post into the portal 
gives them opportunities to stay on top of what is happening. And then I wanna recognize that not every patient does have someone at the bedside. And I have heard from many patients who are navigating their care on their own, who have an iPad or their phone and are trying to stay on top of with a notepad to their bedside, ready with questions when the care team or the nurse or the clinician does come and speak to them. So lots of positives, at least from that perspective. Yeah, we, we've had similar experience. Interestingly, we have anecdotes going back almost 20 years of doctors going to round on their patients and the patients have already seen the results and are ready to have a conversation around the results. Because the tempo of inpatient care is so different, it's very common for the healthcare professionals caring for patients to see things much more quickly than in the outpatient world. Um, and where patients do see things first, it tends to be morning labs and that sort of thing that are, I don't know, maybe a little less scary. So that's actually been a lot easier for us than some of our outpatient care. All right. Any other thoughts? Oh, luckily, we have a very active audience, so I have a ton of questions that I can ask. Uh, so that's great. So Grace, the, the next question is for you. Um, do you mind repeating the opportunities of the patient playing a role in the AI field? I think is the question. Okay, so I'm gonna to try to stay in scope, but I will say that I think there's a lot of opportunities for patients to partner and help co-create the future of an AI field. But going back to my comments, which I believe were on AI powered clinical decision support and comments from advocates that I had heard, celebrating the role of this innovation in their care and curious about the outputs. I'm not talking about the algorithm. I'm talking about the score, the report, the signal that an AI powered clinical decision support tool may be generating that their doctor then may use to make a decision about an individual's care or coordination of care. Patients are very curious and intrigued and wanna be part of that discussion and process as to what was in that output and what it meant for their care, or if it wasn't used, how come their doctor isn't leveraging this new technology that maybe a, another specialist at another hospital may be? So some more insights there. And, um, and I'll also ask the team if they could drop in um, a little bit in our HTI1 rule that I mentioned, we do have a section on algorithm transparency that we're seeking feedback on. So there's a blog and a, um, and a fact sheet that we can um, drop in there if folks are interested. Uh, the next question is for Sean. So any insights on third-party app integrations with Epic? Yeah, sure. So um, Epic has a robust infrastructure for connecting out to third-party apps. We've been doing it for many years. So many groups integrate things in like wayfinding systems, systems for uh, doing explanations of results, um, systems for uh, doing dining, that type of thing in an inpatient scenario. So we, we certainly have the ability to use extensibility um, and in some cases fire to connect out to third party tools that then help improve the patient experience. I, I will note that one kind of cool thing that we've seen on the AI front is we've been very actively working with um, ChatGPT on the ability for physicians to use it to provide patients with instructions um, in at the reading level that they prefer and um, in the language that they read. Um, and it's it's turned out to be excellent at helping with that. All right. And the next question is for all panelists. So is there anything you wish more clinicians knew about the rule allowing patients to see the results immediately? Okay, I'll go. So I will point out something that is still, that causes friction. And then there are, there are still many physicians that are saying, gosh, these information blocking rules are terrible. Gosh, this is causing so much distress to my patients. I need to be the one to tell them about it. This is causing anxiety. And I wanna point out, I'll use the example and analogy of billing. I see patients that get bills in the amounts of thousands, 10,000s, 100,000s, millions of dollars. They open those bills unsupported, they come in the mail when they're by themselves on a Friday, on a Saturday, 
We don't stop selling, sending bills because they might cause harm. And I can assure you that bills are causing harm to patients. I watched people contemplate divorce, want to flee the country, contemplate bankruptcy, forego treatment. We just need structures in place. And Sean, you gave so many fantastic examples. I'm so grateful for all, all of the examples that you shared today. And I think industry really needs to step up to really wrap the individual in more resources when there is something that's concerning. Because this is not a technology problem. It's a matter of now connecting the result from seeing to action what does that person receiving that result when they do? Because sometimes even when a doctor does give the results, it doesn't erase the reality, at least to your experience, that now you have this diagnosis, a cancer, ALS, a chronic condition that you have to deal with. The what do we need to do now and what do we need to do next? There's so many great supports that can be digitally put in place to move that result from seeing it to navigation, to education, and even I'm going to go as far as saying to hacking barriers, how do I use my result to appeal an insurance denial? How do I use my result to file for social security disability benefits? How do I use my result to connect to community supports or to social workers? Lots of opportunities that I think we're, we're not even scratching the surface of right now. I would add that I hope, I hope that more and more people read the work that Trent and team are doing, because I think that... I, I think that the a lot of the fear that's been out there about people getting access to the information has been, um, I don't know if unjustified is the right word, but certainly it's it's not what patients are are telling us at Epic, and and I think what Trent's research bears out. Yeah, and on, and on that note, I actually, you know, Trent mentioned the work of the Open Notes program, and, you know, their work has been foundational um, to sort of laying the case for why this shouldn't be so scary, how it actually strengthens relationships between clinicians and patients, may, helps patients be better prepared for their appointments, allows patients to, to decide on their own. Um, how they want to receive information that, uh, that, that, that can be quite um, disconcerting, but, um, you know, but then to be able to more successfully help navigate their, their care going forward. I, you know, I've, I, I can remember actually the first time I was introduced to open notes, you know, I'm, I'm the HIPAA lawyer and I'm sitting in a room and, and they're talking about how they have this entire program to encourage the the sharing of notes with patients and like uh, uh, hold on a minute that's already required by law HIPAA has required that for more than twenty years all of this has been required by HIPAA for more than twenty years what's changed is the is just how quickly patients get this data because they've always been entitled to it but at the same time that the sort of really groundbreaking work to 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 actually rather than dragging people regulatorily into this to be able to demonstrate to them that there are some real benefits to this. That this is not something that you should feel like is being rammed down your throats or forced on you. Although frankly, if you continue to be resistant, it very well could <clears throat> be. But there's but there are some benefits that you leave on the table as a medical provider if you don't open yourself up to um you know allowing patients to have their data when they want it. Yeah, I, I want to riff off that. Um, you know, my view is that HIPAA, one P, two A's, accessibility, not privacy, which is more than two and a half decades old, basically said patients should be able to access their data. And we, healthcare professionals and health systems and so forth, flipped it on its head and said, oh, no, you can't have that because of HIPAA. And so the information blocking rule is really a course correction, and it's incumbent on us to listen the second time, because I don't like strike three. Um, and, and in general, we've been doing this now for at our health system for more than two years and many other health systems for much longer. And some still aren't doing it, but we're just not hearing all the things we were worried about. In terms of how we educate, well, gosh, back 
two and a half years ago, I was virtually meeting with just about everybody and listening to their concerns. And a lot of their concerns were things we really had to respect and deal with in terms of how we implemented and turned around and educated our patients and communicated with our community. And some of the concerns were things that, well, you know, the research elsewhere has shown that what you're worried about is, a, is an appropriate anxiety, but nonetheless, not something that comes to pass in the real world. Mostly, this is just a major cultural change. And, and then, you know, we flipped the switch and I tried, our team tried to be as available as possible for things that we didn't anticipate. And here we are two years later. And I still occasionally get emails blasted to me about the woman who got her positive breast cancer biopsy on a Friday. Most of the time, it's the healthcare professionals, not the patient, who are upset about that. The patients usually just look into, you know, set up the appointment to go through next steps. But occasionally, we'll get someone who's upset. Mostly, though, it's our healthcare professionals, and we address that simply by taking their concerns seriously, having listening to them, having ongoing conversations to understand what it is they're actually experiencing. Um, and this this is especially hard because our healthcare professionals are currently deeply overwhelmed. We have uh, message basket explosions. Sean, I'm looking to you to fix that too. We have message basket explosions. We have documentation burden and we have increase, increasing belligerence among our patient community at a national level. So it's a really hard time to be a frontline healthcare professional and, and these concerns don't help. But I, I like to think that this is the easiest way forward. And as David Bronckhart who many of you know, has said is that the information blocking rule that putting results in patients' hands quickly, efficiently, allows patients and their healthcare professionals to partner against an otherwise imperfect health system. David, I hope I got that right. Right. Well, that was, that was some amazing answers. And I, I, I wish we had more time, actually, because there's so much I want to kind of build on on that. But I, I'm going to stick to the questions um, generally and <laughs> generally. Um, but there is a follow up question, I think, that falls uh, well into what you were just saying, Trent. And this one actually was for you, but for others as well. So feel free to chime in. And I think it builds on um, the conversation you were just um, discussing. Um, and it's can you talk about how you are educating the provider community on this issue of immediacy, especially as it relates to lab results? We, um, you know, this is all now stuff that we did two and a half years ago, though we do continue to have these conversations. We, we developed a bunch of online modules. I can't tell you how many online educational modules I have to go through each year, um, but we developed a lot of educational modules that our healthcare professionals and our patients could access. What I think really helped was simply socializing, was going out and talking to the clinical departments and talking to the patients and talking to the nurses. Uh, and as I said before, really listening to some of their concerns and uh, re-educating where appropriate or making changes to our planned policies and technical implementation if we maybe had some assumption incorrect um, because this was such a big change. I, I, I feel like that plus all the follow on listening and conversations we had after we went live um, with information blocking rule compliance has really helped. Just incidentally at our institution, we uh, went live January 1st, uh, four months before the compliance date, just so that we uh, could address problems in case any arose before the compliance dates so that we'd be sure to be compliant. Um, and I think our our health system really appreciated that we were taking that thoughtful, careful approach so that we wouldn't have to shut the whole thing down the moment we turned it on. Others? Well, I'll, I'll chime in and I'll say that I think one of the things we have 
definitely heard um, is about the increase in um, the pre-counseling or that provider communication um, that I think it, we've heard it, I think, in multiple ways. One, in terms of how it occurs in the kind of patient to provider you know, environment where the provider's communicating that tests are going to be ordered and here's what may come, you know, what you may see in the test results. Um, you know, you can reach out to me. I think different variances of those types of conversations. So the in-person aspect. I think another part that we've also seen is, the, is that um, uh, health IT systems supporting awareness by the patient that their, their lab results are, um, are behind X, you know, X, uh, X link in the um, portal and letting them know that they may see the results before the patient, um, before the provider actually sees the results. Um, so I think we've heard about that, I'll say provider communication in that regard um, in multiple ways um, and different approaches. And that's, I think the other reason why I'm, I'm so excited about these conversations, because I think what you shared Trent in terms of, um, we had modules and the modules were a helpful start of it, hearing the concerns of providers and then also, seeing what you know, folks like Sean and Devin are doing in terms of how they're supporting communication, that educates and spreads the, you know, spreads the information wider for folks who might be tuning in now or might tune in later and catch the webinar in terms of what opportunities there are for innovation to occur and how they're supporting the implementation of this provision. And then, of course, what Grace is seeing, right, from the perspective of these are how this is how patients are receiving the work that's being done as well. So, Grace, I see you coming off of me, so I'll go to you. Just want to jump in. This was something that really made me pause and think. Patients have told me they provide a mobile or a cell number for a callback number. And many doctors and people in general will take for granted that they have a private space to accept that phone call that may be coming in with results being relayed, not realizing that that person could be at work with multiple employees around them. They could be in the car with their children. They could be on a bus or on a train. And often the caller ID is blocked. So you don't know exactly who's calling. It doesn't say uh, Dr. Rosenblum maybe is calling directly. So you'll pick up and now you're in an awkward conversation saying, oh, I can't really talk or what's a callback number and, or they don't pick up at all. So even something as that, being grateful that the results are in the portal and if they choose to, they can go see it and then follow up with a message either in the portal or follow up with a call to the office gives reassurance because you might not be able to get a hold of that doctor or they're going on vacation or you're going on vacation. You have an opportunity to get those results. I can't, right, so I, I, can't of, under, I can't underscore that more. I was just thinking, I just actually recently, going back to Elise very early when you said we're all patients, I just recently had the experience of being told by my dermatologist that, um, that if my results were negative of a skin biopsy, they would be in my portal within two weeks. If they were positive, they would not be put in my portal and that I would need to call, nevertheless, I shouldn't call the office until two weeks after the biopsy procedure had occurred, requiring me to spend two weeks waiting. Maybe they take that long, I have no idea. And then calling them on the two week day to say, huh, haven't had any communications either way, only to find out in fact, I, I mean, I have a um, basal cell carcinoma. So, and I've had them before, this is not a significant risk of harm situation. <laughs> we, well, I know the drill. I'm a fair skin person. These things happen. But it just occurred to me, like, there is just so much lack of knowledge, I think, in the ambulatory provider community in particular, um, that I think creates a big challenge for patients because for many of them, their expectations are rising, and yet we still have these sort of outdated procedures being followed um, that are... Uh, creating, you know, creating obstacles to patient care and definitely arguably raising concerns about legal compliance. And then I don't want to, I'm the patient in this case, I'm not this person's lawyer. I'm not gonna say <laughs> you need to pay attention to this, but it's yet another example of how, and there was another example in the questions around payment of, you know, having results withheld for until she paid her bill. Like these are just other examples of just the huge patient education, not patient education, provider education, and some patient education challenge that some of this 
is. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'll say, you know, we we definitely are all patients, but it doesn't make it any easier. So I'm I'm glad that you know they found it and they're gonna address it. Um, but I also know it's never never an easy thing to kind of go through. So um, my my thoughts are with you. Um, I I it's it's amazing to me. Um, the, the the progress we've made. You know, I literally remember. Um, where we were five years from now, um, from today. I remember where we were 10 years from now um, in the past <laughs> in terms of access to information, you know, and where we were in conversations around, you know, view, download, transmit or portal usage. And now we are able to actually see our results readily. We're able to see them without unnecessary delay, as we say. So there's been truly so much progress that has happened. Um, and I always say as many rules as we can put together here, it's really about the implementation and it's really about you know ways that we can support education on the rules, but also how they're being implemented and, and watching and engaging as they're being implemented along the way. Um, so I just wanna say a huge thank you to everything that not just our panelists, but everyone who's on the line has been doing and even I think just tuning into this um, kind of webinar and hearing this conversation is, is so important because it's all about understanding, you know, here's where we are, here's the progress we have made. And this goes to my, my last question for the day is what's next, right? So um, I'm curious for each of the panelists about what are you looking forward to? What are you looking forward to in this conversation in terms of seeing, in terms of innovation, um, in terms of something not being an issue anymore that is today, whatever it may be. Tell me a little bit about what that looks like for you. And I'll go to Sean first. Oh, okay. All right. So what, you know, one of my big focal points is from a health equity standpoint, making sure that I think we mentioned this at the beginning, get, getting over the digital divide and making sure that everybody has access. So finding new broader ways to get access providing omni-channel communication. So whether I'm initiating that access through a text, an email on an old flip phone or on a smartphone, that there's ways that patients can get in and just simply be able to access this. And then the second level is once somebody has access, having all of the multilingual accessibility support so that every patient uh, you know, isn't limited just based on a language barrier, for example, from being able to see and understand the result. And then really the next level beyond that is something that Devin talked a lot about, which is the explainability of results and starting to rethink, um, particularly like in imaging results, the language around how we express that to patients and creating uh, results that are more interactive and comprehensible. And uh, I think the impact of all of that together will just will make it much easier for patients to to end up making good decisions about what they need from their healthcare. And then obviously that revolves in uh, or moves into shared decision-making tools and journeys that patients can access and be on where they're seeing not only what this result says, but then what the next steps in the care process look like. Thank you, Sean, that's so helpful. All right, so I'm gonna go to um, Grace and then Devin and then uh, Trent to give you all some forewarning on next. <laughs> I think I'm looking forward to a time and place where doctors and patients are not pitted against each other, but we're on the same team. And I think by having access to information, so doctors have plenty of access to a lot of information, maybe not all the information that they need. We need to catch up patients on and their care partners and their caregivers and their families and give them the information tools and technology and clinical decision supports so that they can proactively really participate in shared decision making. And then it becomes how the industry responds to that same team, shared decision making, shared accountability model. So I'm really looking forward to that. And then I think looking forward to a day when not only do a doctor and a patient have access, but everyone on that care team, even outside of an institution in another state, if a patient says, my primary care doctor or this specialist need it, uh, I'd love to see an audit trail of that, that yes, I don't even have to ask, Grace said this and it's gonna go and it's done. And I don't have to worry about showing up to my appointment and my primary care doctor has no idea I was hospitalized. So we're making progress. I see hope for that future. 
Devin, over to you. Well, I, you know, I kind of, I'm going to squeeze two in, but be quick about it so I don't take too much time. One is the increased amount of, in, of information that a patient has the right to under under federal law available through a, a connection to a portal, like images more ubiquitously, pathology reports, some of the things that Grace covered in her first talk. That's that's super exciting. But I'm also pretty excited about the national network, the Trusted Exchange Framework and Common Agreement, the ability of patients to not necessarily have to connect an app to every single endpoint where they've received care, but to launch a query into a national network and through one query, get the data from every endpoint collected in their app, no need to deal with refresh tokens, maintaining them, no need to continually, you know, keep your username and password up to date to keep your app all connected. If you can change an app much more easily that way in terms of, of, of um, getting all your data. So, so that's kind of exciting to me. All right, and Trent, over to you. To me, the really exciting aspect of the information blocking rule is that it gives patients and their uh, care team, I mean, their non-professional care team, more choice, more control, more power. Um, we have seen this, our research shows this, research we plan to do, we'll dive deeper into this. Where we've been challenged is where implementation in the real world with existing policies, workflows, EHR systems and so forth has um, not given more power, just changed what happened. So in many cases, and Sean talked about some solutions to this, HT1 uh, organizes some solutions to this. Patients who previously couldn't access their electronic health information now may not be able to avoid their electronic health information. This can be particularly challenging uh, when we take care of adolescents, when we take care of people in um, complex social contexts, and often in situations where people want access to their cholesterol, but not to their colon biopsy. And so I look forward to the next steps where the policy, the culture, and the tools give us much more granular control over what we access, when we access it, how we access it, and with whom we share it or choose not to share it. But well, mostly I'm really excited about how far we've come. Thank you. Um, so uh, those responses are a perfect way to close out. I, I just, I mean, I'm so excited, um, not only about where we are, but I know there's more work to be done. There's more progress to be made. Um, but as Trent said, and everyone else on the panel, you know, we are really moving in the right direction. I look forward to that continuing. Um, I have to give a huge shout out to my team, not only for today and supporting the wonderful notes that you're getting in the chat in terms of some of the things that the panelists have talked about, but also for the work on the rule, it's uh, on our rules, uh, whether it's our rules or our policy frameworks like TEFCA or it's our strategic planning or our work, uh, you know, with state, with our federal partners, with our state partners. It really um, is something that I think we have an amazing team and our goal every day is to make sure that we're really advancing health IT for the benefit of care. So huge, huge thank you to my team. I also want to note September is right around the corner because can anyone believe it's June already? I know I can't. So September is right around the corner. And in September, we're going to have an in-person patient access event is our, is our plan. So I, be on the lookout for that. Best way to, fit, to find out what's going on there is to sign up for our listserv. So um, please do that. And we'll be talking, we'll be posting more about um, the patient access event as we get closer to it. But please look out for that. If you think this was great, that's going to be phenomenal. <laughs> uh, we're really looking forward to um, having a number of different conversations around patient, patient access and how to support it. Um, and I think that covers all the things I wanted to mention. Again, just a huge thank you for taking the time to join me today. Thank you to the audience for joining us as well. I hope this has been helpful. And don't forget to check out our website. Um, 
resources like Get It, Check It, Use It for your health care, for your health information is there. Those are great tools for you to have as a patient, as a provider to share with your patients about how they can access their information and what it can do for them. So thank you again. Thank you again. Thank you again. Thank you again. It's been a great session and I really appreciate all of you panelists for joining us. Thanks, Elise. Thanks, Elise. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Elise.